morning, everyone. Um, you know, I, uh, I was asked to speak at uh, this stage and, and maybe deliver a special um, keynote uh, to entrepreneurs. And, uh, and at the end of the day, I'm an entrepreneur. And, uh, and I like what I do. And I, uh, I like to solve problems. So, um, you know, the keynote will be about falling in love with the problem, not the solution. So think about how the world is going to be better if you actually solve the problem. Um, so entrepreneurship, you know, it's always start with a very strong feeling, either hate, so I hate traffic jams, right, or, or love. And then you develop the passion and the dream and you uh, realize that you are going to sacrifice a lot of things. Um, and you realize that this is the journey itself is a roller coaster with ups and downs and ups and downs. And it's always harder than you think it is. And at the same time, there is no doubt what's next, right? If you would ask an entrepreneur, what are you going to do after this startup? Then they will tell you, it's the next startup. And if you'll ask them, okay, what's the next startup is all about? They would actually tell you. They already know. So, uh, you know, I started Waze with my, um, with, uh, we started Waze in 2007. And by 2009, I already knew that my next startup is going to be FX and deals with financial fees. And so to a certain extent, entrepreneurship is exactly like, like falling in love. So try to compare them, right? There are many ideas that you think of and eventually you fall in love with one or many girls that you date and eventually you, you fall in love with one. And once you do, you kind of take that to the next level and you take your date out to meet your friends, right? Or you start to tell, tell, to tell the story about your idea to your friends and then they tell you that your ideas suck or this is the stupid idea that I ever heard and, and you know, I have heard that so many times. Uh, or they tell you that she's not for you and then you actually disengage from your friends. So the key factors for the first year, and if you are in the first year, then, then this is something that may be worthwhile writing down. Fundraising. This is like fuel to the car of your journey, right? So if you don't have a fuel, the journey is going to be very, very short. Uh, if you do need fundraising, if you do need to raise funds, then build the, the assets that you need in order to build this. The day that you start your journey, the day that you actually establish the company and say, this is the problem that I'm going to solve, and this is why the world is going to be a better place, and this is my mission in life, you actually start another thing, which is a working place, right? You start a company, and it's up to you to decide what kind of DNA this company would have, and this is up to you to dream about it and basically say, I'm going to build the best working place I ever had, uh, because if you don't, then at the end of the first year, the company will have a culture and a DNA of itself. And if it's not the one that you choose, then you might end up with something that you don't like. Focus, focus is not about what we are doing. It's actually about what we are not doing. These are the hard choices. Saying no to everything that is not the one thing that we want to do. In order to be successful with a startup, you need to do one thing right. That's it. One thing right. So I think now you're going to hear me a little bit better, uh, hopefully. Um, the journey itself is long and in particular the longest part of it is the one that says lack of traction, right? So this is like uh, in your journey crossing a desert, right? So imagine yourself crossing the desert or, or rowing a rowboat in the ocean, right? So everything looks exactly the same. And you don't, even, you don't even notice that you're making progress, but you do. You're making small steps and you're making progress. Two things that you want to remember in the middle of the desert. Number one, don't change direction because then you might end up going in circles. And the other one is that you don't want to run out of fuel because fuel is very expensive in the middle of the desert. If you want to ask yourself whether or not you have a big idea, ask yourself who will be out of business if you are successful. How the market will change if you are successful. If you don't know how will, uh, who will be out of business, then the idea maybe is not big enough. So, uh, and, and celebrating, right? So, so remember that we celebrate everything on a startup. Think about the budget, right? So, so human resources, operation, marketing, travel, and alcohol. Right? That's actually, um, <clears throat> you need to have a lot of alcohol in order to celebrate, and you celebrate many things. Right? The first user, the first P 
OKR, the first employee, the first time that you raise funds, everything that happens the first time you celebrate. Much more important than that, if, you tend, if someone is suing you for patent infringement, right? So this means that you are important enough for someone. That means that you are making an impact in someone that cares is willing to spend some money on that. The best thing is that, and in particular in consumer space, if you build something and people come to you and say, thank you, you helped me. So the startup journey is very simple, right? We are looking for a problem, and then we are looking for the users that actually have this problem. So we are looking for their perception of the problem, not our perception. Our perception is excellent sample of one person. And what we really would like to get is the feedback, collecting feedback from other people so we can understand their perception of the problem and then build a solution for that. So that's the journey. Now the way, is, the way story is very simple. You know, when we start, that's the magic of waste. This is how we started, right? That was the map of Israel when we started. That was the map of Dublin. That was the map of anywhere when we started, blank page. And when driver drove, we actually collected GPS data from the device itself so we can create the map out of that. And we collected that from many people. It's starting to look like that. So if I will tell you that this is a, a traffic circle. It looks like a traffic circle, right? And, uh, and essentially, if we will look at the, uh, at the more dense area, that will be main road versus street. And if we will see um, you know, an intersection that no one is making a right turn, then we can figure out that no right turn is allowed. And if we will see a road that there are 100 people going into one direction and there, there is no one else coming the other direction, that will be one-way street. And uh, you know, a road that there are 100 people going into one direction and only five coming the other direction, that turns out to be one-way street in Tel Aviv. So th <laughs> this is how we drive. Later on, when we launched globally, we realized that we actually need to readjust the algorithm to support some other places. Uh, and so the system actually created a map out of that. And then we enable map editing tools that allow people to provide with uh, street names and house numbers and points of interest and so forth that made the map nearly complete. So the magic of Waze was about crowdsourcing of all the data, the map and the traffic information from the users. Now, at this point of time, if we will have someone driving and all of a sudden driving slow, we can figure out that there is a traffic jam and mark that on the map, but in addition, understand how to route people to avoid and to bypass traffic jams. And once we have a lot of people, then obviously the magic works and we have complete traffic maps of where traffic jams are everywhere and we can solve that and we can actually route people around traffic jams to avoid that. Does it really work? Um, so what we have here is a um, few places in Eastern Europe how the map was created uh, <clears throat> in, in, um, you know, in, in a period of time that was relatively short. So we can see the beginning of 2010, and that will actually zoom in into the center area of Bratislava, and what you can see is how the map was actually created. The interesting part is that it took about uh, six months for the map to become good enough. And as soon as the map becomes good enough, then all of a sudden you reach the critical mass and you win the market. And so remember that, if you are free and good enough, you win every time. Free and good enough wins the market. Um, so it took about six months for that map to be created in multiple places, in Eastern Europe, in Latin America, and then later on in Western Europe and in the US. Um, took a little bit longer for a period of time, uh, but eventually it becomes the best uh, uh, driving application. By the way, if you drive someplace that no one drove before, then your avatar change into a roller steamer and you pave the road as you drive. And as soon as you drive, that road is actually becoming part of the map and everyone else can use that. So when you're thinking of making an impact, <clears throat> so, so think about disruption. Think about how things will be done differently. It's not about technology. It's about how the market behaves differently. It's about how um, users behave differently. It's about different behavior 
that he can change the market. Uh, so just imagine a um, very simple example. Um, you know, Waze was the first free driving application out there. Beforehand, you can buy navigation devices, you can download navigation apps that cost you a lot of money or subscription. <clears throat> you can have even, um, you know, from the mobile operator provided um, navigation apps, but all of them were, um, were costing money. And Waze was the first one to be free. So look at this model and try to, uh, to figure out whether or not this model is applicable for you. So the first one is about user emotions. How do people feel, not think, feel about the problem, right? So I hate traffic jams. And I guess everyone else hates traffic jams as well. So if you can encourage hate, hate is a very strong feeling that actually makes people do something about it. Uh, or love. Or if you can make many of those examples, you make, uh, you make people feel like um, uh, helpless and then they want to address that. Uh, the next one will be the size of the market. And the size of the market could be measured either by number of users or by number of or amount of money there. Um, and then disruption is about how the market will be different, not about technology, about how the market will behave different. Usually there is one trick that allows you to do that. This one trick is very, very unique. And then the impact, what would happen if you are successful? So look at ways. You know, so, um, so everyone hates traffic jams, right? But we were able to actually harness all the drivers to fight the common enemy, which is the traffic jams, right? So all the drivers together are actually helping each other to avoid traffic jams. Uh, a billion cars on the planet, and the disruption it was that it was free, and it actually had actionable traffic information. So a new product that was not available and free together wins the market. The trick is crowdsourced in this case, so um, the data itself was generated by the drivers and the impact, you know, when we started, there were map makers, there were traffic makers, there were, um, uh, there were navigation players, none of them actually exist today. <coughs> Movit, which by the way, the CEO of Movit will be speaking on a different stage at uh, half past 12, is like Waze, but for public transportation. And it's actually solved the same problem. We helpless when we get to the bus station. We have no clue when the bus is going to arrive and, and what's the best route for us to take. And it's actually following pretty much the same concept, right? So a trillion trips per, per annum, uh, the disruption is that they are actually global players. So you can use that everywhere. Uh, and the trick is crowdsource, the same trick. Actually, in many places where information is missing, Crowdsource will be probably the best way to, to get that information. Um, another company of mine, uh, NG. NG deals with the frustrations of going to the mechanic. And um, just imagine what happened when you go there, right? Whatever they will tell you, you'll say yes, because we don't know, right? So if, if the mechanic will tell me that I need to replace the carburetor in my car, I will say, okay, go ahead and do that. Now, the only problem is that they don't make cars with carburetors anymore. So NG is about an app running on your smartphones, connects to the car computer, doing the diagnostics for you, uh, and then asking for a quotation from mechanics around you to, solve, to, to repair that. And it's the first time that you can actually do price comparison. Now, what price comparison does, obviously lower the price, but it's actually create new market equilibrium because the new price is very different than, the, than the, the price today that information is not available. Um, Fairfly. Um, Fairfly deals with the biggest secret in the travel industry, and this is what happens to the airfare after we book our flight. So we all know that airfare changes, right? Changes dramatically based on the demand. It would be going up and down and up and down and so forth. But there is a certain point of time that we actually book the flight. Now, the reality is that the price are keeping going up and down after that, but we never check that. So Fairflies monitor your own itinerary, and as soon as it does, as soon as the price drops, it actually alerts you and tells you, right now, you're leaving money on the table. One click, rebook the same flight, and save yourself money. Um, and, uh, and again, the, the business itself is pretty big. People actually leaving $100 billion on the table because we don't check after. 
Um, I'll skip a couple of them. Waze was acquired in June 2013. I left the day after the acquisition, literally the day after. Now, I left in order to build FIEX. And FIEX actually deals with uh, the biggest secret in the world, $600 billion of financial fees that Americans are paying, and most of them don't even know that. Right? If I will be walking down the street and ask 100 people in the US how much fees you are paying on your retirement plan, if I would find one person that knows, that's going to be my lucky day. Now, the reality is that for most of them, this is means about one-third of their retirement. And this is a big impact to make. And, uh, um, you know, my dad once told me that if you don't know how much you are paying, you are paying too much. And it doesn't matter for what. If you don't know how much you are paying, you are paying too much. So, um, so just imagine, okay, assume that you are 30 years old and you're starting to, to save for retirement and you're actually paying only 1% a year management fees. 1% a year. Doesn't sound like a lot, right? Now, the compound effect of that, if you assume that you're going to retire at the age of 70, the compound effect of that, how much will you pay? One third. That's, you know, if you would start with a million dollars and you put that in a deposit, and pay on that deposit 1% a year, that's one-third. So uh, summarizing maybe for, um, for, for the key tips for entrepreneurs, um, you know, the first one is understand who the users are and what's their perception of the problem. Make your mistakes fast. And that means that uh, you know, the biggest enemy of good enough is perfect. Right? If you try to build something perfect, then someone else that is good enough is going to win the market. If you, if you, if you hesitate whether or not you are ready to go to launch, you were ready a long time ago. You already passed the time that you are ready. Um, the DNA and the mission define your journey and, um, you know, and make that journey count. Because at the end of the day, you know, you want to make a better world, but you also want to enjoy the journey itself. Uh, and so these, th these two things will actually define that. Fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Every day that the problem is still out there, then go and solve that. But if someone else did, then it doesn't matter anymore. If the problem disappeared, it doesn't matter. Find another problem to solve. Focus, we mentioned that, and don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to fail because the journey itself is a journey of failures. You try something, it doesn't work. You try something else, it doesn't work. Eventually, you find something that works, and then you shift gears and you try to scale, and then it doesn't work, and you try something else to scale. And it's basically a journey of failures. You move from one failure to another failure until you find the one thing that works for you. A lot of us are going to, uh, to raise funds, and uh, in a few tips that relates to that, and uh, um, and, you know, about a couple of months ago, I, I met with one of the, uh, of the VCs in Israel, one of the partners, and I asked them, how long does it take you to decide if you like the entrepreneur or not? And so they look at me and they say, um, you know, before they sit down. So it's a matter of seconds, and that, that's the reality. The first impression takes us seconds to make. And therefore, and then you have maybe a few minutes to change that. And therefore, you always start with the strongest point at the beginning. Um, and remember that they are users too, so they need to actually associate with the emotional engagement of the problem. If they don't, if they don't see themselves as users, they are not going to invest. Learn how to tell a story, that's critical, and in particular when you have very, very short period of time to do that. Um, so I think, you know, time here says that I'm overdue and I think that I'm done. Uh, find a big problem to solve. Make the world a better place for all of us. Thank you.